How do we figure out what a language model believes is true? This is the question motivating the work Discovering Latent Knowledge in Language Models Without Supervision by Burns, Yeu, Klein, and Steinhardt. In this video, I'll describe the key ideas of this paper and the problem that it focuses on. First, why is this even a hard question? Can't you just like ask the language model to tell you what it really thinks? Sadly, this may not work. But why? Well, first, if we train a model to imitate human-generated text, it may learn to output common misconceptions, even if it knows better. If we train a chatbot to optimize a reward such as engagement, it may learn to generate text that is compelling but false. Are we going to do that? Uh, maybe. And there's another problem. If we try to reward model outputs that look true, a model may still learn to output false text if human raters can't evaluate the correctness of that text. As AI models move towards superhuman abilities in various domains, it's a big problem if we can't trust them to tell us what they think is true once we are no longer able to provide supervision. This issue is closely related to the core challenge outlined in the eliciting latent knowledge proposal I discussed in a previous video. The big question here was about generalization. If we are only able to provide a supervisory signal for a small fraction of the actions that an advanced AI can take, how can we train a reporter to tell us everything we'd like to know once we move to sequences that humans are not capable of evaluating, represented here by the rest of this big grey blob? It's a very tricky business. To overcome this pesky challenge, the authors in this work explore a different approach, using models to answer questions in a purely unsupervised way. Well, that sounds magical. How can this possibly work? The key idea here is to leverage the fact that a model's representation of truth must satisfy logical consistency properties. Importantly, these consistency properties are unlikely to be satisfied by many other features. Since this may sound a little abstract, let's jump straight to the problem definition for discovering latent knowledge. Here it is. Given a pre-trained neural language model and a set Q1 to Qn of yes-no questions, the author's goal is to answer each QI correctly. Well, that sounds like a reasonable goal. The questions here can be any question with a well-defined answer. For example, is 22 plus 59 237? The answer, as you may have guessed, is no. And are cats mammals? The answer is yes. Meow. Now, a key part of the problem is that the authors want to answer these questions with methods that do not rely on the model generating correct outputs. Because what if I have trained my language model to ruthlessly maximize engagement? It may not be trying to be particularly truthful. They also do not want to rely on external supervision. Because what if I want to ask questions that humans cannot reliably answer correctly to provide that supervision? The approach they are going to take is to use the model's unlabeled hidden representations. We'll need some notation here. We'll let phi x in r to the d represent some feature corresponding to a text input x, like for example the hidden states of a transformer-based language model. Then the goal is to answer the questions when only given access to the features. Let's look at the method. It's called contrast consistent search. The key insight that lets us get away with avoiding supervision is that truth has special structure. In particular, it satisfies consistency properties that few other features in a language model are likely to satisfy. What is this special source, you ask? Truth satisfies negation consistency. This means that the answer to a clear-cut question cannot be both yes and no at the same time. This method may not work very well for politics. In probability terms, for each question QI, the probability that the answer to QI is yes should be 1 minus the probability that the answer to QI is no. With this idea in mind, we can construct contrast pairs. Starting from our n clear-cut questions involving arithmetic and cats, we can create n statements by sticking yes on the end of each question. We will denote these with a little plus symbol and color the variables blue. And we can also create a second set of n statements by sticking no on the end of each question. These will use a little minus symbol and are colored orange. Next, we can feed each of our statements into the model and extract features. Finally, we use a simple learned linear probe, p theta, to regress the probability 
that the statement is true based on the features. We apply this probe to the yes statements and to the no statements. But how do we learn this p theta, you may ask? This is where the consistency of truth comes in. We're going to learn theta on a bunch of contrast pairs so that the probability of one statement being true is approximately equal to one minus the probability that its negation is true. This is wonderful and elegant, but the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed a trivial solution. The p theta probe could just map everything to 0.5. That would always satisfy objective one here. So we also have to gently persuade it to assign different probabilities to the versions of the same question that end in yes and no. If we can do this, whenever we want to estimate the probability that a particular statement is true, we can take the average of the probability that the statement is true and one minus the probability that its negation is true. And voila, we get an estimated probability without ever requiring truth labels. That's really the key idea. I'll talk next about a few details. The first relates to feature extraction and normalization. Think about what is different between these two sets of statements. One difference, the exciting one we care about, is that exactly one is true and one is false. The second difference, the less exciting but more obvious one, is that in each pair, one ends in yes and one ends in no. We want to learn what the model believes is true, not whether a sentence ends in yes or no. That would not be exciting. To try to avoid the second effect from dominating, the features are normalized by subtracting their means and standard deviations within each statement type. This normalization ensures that the two sets of features no longer form two separate clusters. The probe that is used for mapping activations to probabilities is just a linear projection followed by a sigmoid. Now we come to the fun part, the training objective. How can we learn the probe so that it satisfies these two properties? With loss functions, of course, because we are machine learners and we love loss functions. The first loss is the consistency loss. You can see that this minimizes the squared difference between the predicted probability that the yes statement is true and one minus the predicted probability that the no statement is true. To avoid the degenerate solution of this loss, where the probe maps the probability of yes statements and the probability of no statements to 0.5, regardless of whether it believes they are true, a confidence loss is used. This encourages the model to assign a low probability to at least one of the statements. Giving them both 0.5 will not make this loss happy. When it comes to inference, in principle, both p of xi plus and 1 minus p of xi minus should represent the probability that the answer to question qi is yes. But since we've only used a soft consistency constraint in the form of a loss, they are not likely to be exactly equal. So the authors simply take the average of these. This is the term we saw earlier. There is one last subtlety here. The probe could have learned to estimate the probability that a statement is true or not true equally well. Both are consistent with the loss function. So there is a final step in which the authors pick whichever of the two meanings work best on the test set. There are ways to avoid this if needed. Let's look at the experimental setup. The authors study encoder-decoder models, autoregressive models, and encoder-only models. Models are tested on 10 datasets, spanning sentiment classification, topic classification, natural language inference, story completion, question answering, and common sense reasoning. The baselines compared to are zero-shot, calibrated zero-shot, which works by balancing zero-shot predictions to be 50-50 for each answer, and supervised logistic regression. The hidden states used as features are the last token in the last layer of each model. On to the results. First, CCS outperforms zero-shot when averaging across all prompts and datasets. CCS is found to outperform the zero-shot baseline and calibrated zero-shot baseline. This is quite surprising, given how simple the loss functions are, though CCS is still a fair way short of the supervised logistic regression baseline. The next finding is that CCS is robust to misleading prompts. Here, it's useful to remember that the goal of this work is to discover latent knowledge in a language model even when the model outputs false text. To explore whether CCS achieves this, the authors construct prompt prefixes that contain a bunch of incorrect text, like 
What is the human life expectancy in the United States? 10 years. And what is the square root of banana? 42. Since language models aim to imitate text, the basic idea here is that if you prefix the test question with this gobbledygook, then it's more likely to give a false answer. For the unified QA model, this is indeed what happens. We have regular accuracy on the x-axis and prefixed accuracy on the y-axis. The fact that the orange line has shifted substantially to the right means that the zero-shot baseline gets more questions wrong with the new prefix. By contrast, CCS on the same model performs similarly or even slightly better when the prefix is full of falsehoods. This provides evidence that the CCS method can still work well even when the model outputs are unreliable. Okay, so CCS seems to work. But in what sense is CCS actually finding truth features? The authors poke around at this question by analysing CCS. First, they observe that CCS finds a task agnostic representation of truth. For most datasets, they find that they can train on one and test on another and get relatively similar performance to training and testing on the same dataset. This suggests that CCS is not just picking up on dataset specific details. Great. Next finding. CCS does not just recover model outputs. We've seen that CCS can outperform zero-shot accuracy, so that's some evidence against the claim that it just recovers knowledge that could be found in the text outputs of the model. As further evidence, the authors also find that for some models, using hidden states in the middle of the network outperform hidden states at the end of the network when using CCS. If CCS only recovered knowledge that could be found in the generated text from the model, you'd expect the last layers to work best. Next finding. Truth is a salient feature. In practice, CCS doesn't require much data. In fact, it can often do well with very limited data. It is also found that simply taking the top principal component of the differences in normalized hidden states across contrast pair embeddings also works fairly well. That gives this row CRC TPC, which is slightly weaker than CCS, but still outperforms the calibrated zero-shot baseline. This strengthens the idea that representations of truth may be salient features inside models that are relatively easy to find. In terms of related work, CCS relates to prior studies examining zero-shot prompting, particularly those that also leverage unsupervised consistency properties, albeit in a way that does not meet the criteria for discovering latent knowledge. There is also prior work on truthfulness, as well as work that has aimed to go beyond the direct supervision humans can provide by augmenting supervision with AI systems. But many of these proposals remain theoretical, perhaps most related. Eliciting latent knowledge is about eliciting knowledge from models even in cases where humans cannot evaluate that knowledge. Here, the authors note that eliciting latent knowledge frames this as a worst-case theoretical problem, while this work frames it as an empirical problem that we can make progress on using current models. Let's turn to limitations. CCS requires that a model is both capable of evaluating the truth of a given input, and also that the model actively evaluates the truth of that input. Is this a reasonable assumption? As they say, it is not clear when these conditions hold precisely. Also, CCS was not evaluated on setups involving active lying or deception. That would seem like a natural thing to do, given the aims of this work. However, they aren't aware of any existing evaluation setups for this setting. If tests get built, a good stress test would be to apply CCS to do lie detection in that setting. A few closing comments for me. The unsupervised nature of this approach makes it a promising line of attack, so I very much hope there is further work that builds on this effort. It is worth noting that there are many subtleties about what exactly the model may learn to represent and how this relates to beliefs. In a forum post, the lead author Colin Burns suggests that my guess is that current language models may represent truth-like features that very roughly correspond to what a human would say is true, and that's it. In contrast, I would guess that future superhuman language models may also represent a feature corresponding to what the model thinks is actually true. In addition to what, how precisely AI models end up representing truth, whether it's some easily accessible feature that can be extracted with a linear probe, or some gnarlier thing distributed throughout the network, seems like a particularly valuable thing to investigate further. So I'd also be excited to see work probing that direction. If you'd like to find out more about this paper, I recommend four further resources. 
there's a notebook that walks through how CCS can be run on simple examples. Second, a forum post that I'll link to in the comments explains how Colin views this work as fitting into a broader AI alignment agenda, and explains what, in his view, the research does and doesn't demonstrate. Third, I recommend an interview with Colin on the Inside View podcast, which explains the motivation behind the work, and also how he came to hold a Rubik's Cube world record. Finally, I recommend a recent critique of this work called Still No Lie Detector for Language Models, Probing Empirical and Conceptual Roadblocks, which provides empirical results that show that methods such as CCS fail to generalise in very basic ways, and suggest some concrete paths for future work. That's it, we've reached the end. Thank you for your attention, I hope you have a wonderful day.